this year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Wednesday, October the 7th, 2020. On this edition of The Politocrat, a preview of tonight's debate between the vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris, the senator of California, and the current vice president, Mike Pence. That and more coming up next. Johnny Nash with I Can See Clearly Now. Yesterday, Johnny Nash passed away at the age of 80. He died of natural causes. The legendary reggae artist, R&B man, and singer-songwriter Johnny Nash was born here in the United States and died in Houston yesterday at the age of 80. I Can See Clearly Now is recognized as his most famous song and his biggest hit. The song was from 1972. My favorite Johnny Nash song for sure. May Johnny Nash rest in power.
that was Eddie Van Halen. His guitar riff in Michael Jackson's Beat It, both in the song and then isolated, as you heard, really was one of the things that made that Michael Jackson tune really pop and really stand up on its own. Just great guitarist. One of the great legendary guitarists was Eddie Van Halen. And sadly, he's no longer here. He passed away as well yesterday. And he was just 65 years of age. He had had a long and substantial fight against cancer. And that cancer took his life yesterday. Eddie Van Halen, of course, was part of the group Van Halen. One of the great guitar riffs in that group that he was in, of course, the family Van Halen, was from Jump, the 1980s tune, of course, with David Lee Roth as lead singer at that point of Van Halen, when Van Halen really was a supernova of a group in the pop music world. Pop rock was their thing, and that guitar riff from that tune is also a really good one. Eddie Van Halen, one of the great guitarists that we've ever seen, passed away yesterday at the age of 65. May Eddie Van Halen rest in power. That was Eddie Van Halen's riff in the song Jump from Van Halen back in the 1980s. Now, you know you're getting old when you hear that both Johnny Nash and Eddie Van Halen passed away. And not only that, passed away on the same day. Um, on top of it, I should say. Not only. these are We've lost two really great people. We've lost two legendary people, Johnny Nash, um, a little bit older than Eddie was, but certainly um, somebody who I remember um, from, you know, way back when, you know, it, it's very sad, you know, this year, and I've not even got to any of the main subject matter yet, and this year has been truly one of the most awful, awful years I just mean just universally, not necessarily personally, although certainly, look, this pandemic brings so many different challenges and different challenges for different people who are differently situated. But this calendar year, 2020, can we just skip these next three months? You know, can we just skip October, November and December and get to you know, January 2021. What a horrible calendar year this has been. And I, I keep saying there have been other calendar years that have been pretty darn rough. 1968, um, you know, we can go back to uh, you know, 1863, 1865, um, had its challenges, even though there were some really good things about that year. Um, you know, you can go back to so many different years in between the 1930s, um, man, 1920s, but my goodness me, 2020. For those of us who were around, you know, 1918 obviously was a really rough year around the world. My goodness me, 2020, for those of us who weren't around in 1918 or even 1933 or 1940. Good heavens, this, the, you know, what have we done to make <laughs> the powers that be so upset with us? Well, I, I think there are things that we, some of us have done. 
Um, but I don't know if this is something from the powers above or, or not. Um, and maybe some of you believe in a higher power, maybe you don't. And I don't necessarily want to go off track here. But my goodness gracious me, this year has been brutal, to say the least. So two greats have passed. My goodness me. Um, Mr. Johnny Nash and Mr. Edward Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen. Um, and both of these people were decent people too, you know. It's always the good ones, right? I mean, you know, it's like what Billy Joel once sang, you know. Uh, you know, and, and trust me, being 65 is young. That's a young age. 65 is young. 80, oh, you know, you're just, you know, you've lived a pretty decent amount of years. When you get to 80 and above, I always say, once you get to 80, you've lived, that's a good life. That's a good long life. Anything 80 and above is is a good life, is a good long life. So Johnny Nash did that, and I'm sad that he has passed. And um, there'll always be, among other songs, they will always be, I can see clearly now, which, as far as I'm concerned, was about depression. Um, you know? Um, I don't know if that's what Johnny Nash intended the song to be. I've not read up on what he may have thought about it, but certainly when I hear that song, that's what I think he's singing about. Not that I've been in that position, um, but I, I do think that that's what he was singing about. But look, the song's a terrific song. You know, I can see clearly now has been used in so many movies. One of the most memorable uses of. Johnny Nash's I Can See Clearly Now was in the film Thelma and Louise. The film was released in 1991. And there's that great moment in the movie. And I'm sorry if people have not yet seen Thelma and Louise. It's almost 30 years old, for heaven's sake. (laughs) I'm sorry if you haven't seen it, but I'm going to give this away. Spoiler alert. Where a police officer has been locked in the trunk of his own police car. And I forget which one it was, Thelma or Louise, who shot bullet holes into it. And so there were some air pockets where this cop could at least breathe, right? And this <laughs> Arastafarian, <laughs> Arastafarian brother comes along on his bike. You know, he's cycling through, <laughs> I don't know where it is in, in Arizona, not far from the Grand Canyon, I guess. And he's, <laughs> and he, 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 he hears this, he sees the police car. He hears this voice in the trunk saying, hey, hey, because obviously the person in the trunk, the cop can hear that there's someone nearby. <laughs> and the Rastafarian man, the brother, he comes up to the, he comes up to the to the to the trunk. <laughs> He's smoking some weed, I I guess. <laughs> he just blows the smoke. <laughs> he blows the smoke into the bullet holes <laughs> of the trunk where the cop is locked in. <laughs> and uh, when I saw that movie in the movie theater, when it was released in 1991, I, not just myself, the whole audience, we were all in there laughing. It was, <laughs> and he just just calmly moved on. It, it was that to me, that's the best scene in Thelma and Louise. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I love that movie. No disrespect to Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis. They did an excellent job. I loved their characters. Um, Heck, I didn't like what happened to them, but they did it on their terms is what I take away from that movie, among many, many other things. And that men are a bunch of dicks, which, um, you know, that's a whole nother thing that I I, I can get into, but not today. Um, (laughs) That that scene with Johnny Nash's record song playing over that moment is just perfect. (laughs) Thank you very much, Ridley Scott and and Callie Curry, who wrote the screenplay, and to the actor who played the Rastafarian man, and also to the the guy who played the cop too. Actually, being being in that trunk and, and calling for help as he did, and and thank you, Johnny Nash, most of all. 
for that song. And and uh, again, rest in power, sir. Next, a preview of the vice presidential debate between Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Mike Pence. Welcome back. Admiral Stockdale, your opening statement, please, sir. Who am I? Why am I here? (laughs) I'm not a politician. Everybody knows that. So don't expect me to use the language of the Washington Insider. 37 years in the Navy, and only one of them up there in Washington. And now I'm an academic. I have as much experience in the Congress as Jack Kennedy did when he sought the presidency. I will be prepared to deal with the people in the Bush administration if that unfortunate event would ever occur. Senator Benson? Senator, I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. That that was really uncalled for, Senator. You're the one that was making the comparison, Senator. And I'm one who knew him well. And frankly, I think you're so far apart in the objectives you choose for your country that I did not think the comparison was well taken. Vice Here's President Biden. Look, Vice Vice President President Biden. Biden. Let me translate. Let, let, let me have a chance to translate. I'll come back in a second then, right? First of all, I was there when Ronald Reagan tax breaks. When he gave specifics of what he was going to cut. No, number one, in terms of tax expenditures. Mm-hmm. Number two, 97 percent of the small business in America pay less, make less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Let me tell you who some of those other small businesses are. Hedge funds. They make six, eight hundred million dollars a year. That, that's what they count as small businesses because they're passed through. Let's look at how sincere they are. Ronald, I mean, excuse me, uh, Governor Romney on 60 min- Minutes, I guess it was about 10 days ago, was asked, Governor, you pay 14 percent on 20 million dollars. Someone making 50 thousand dollars pays more than that. Do you think that's fair? He said, oh, yes, that's fair. That's fair. This is, and they're going to talk about, you think these guys are going to go out there and cut those loopholes? The loophole, the biggest loophole they take advantage of is the carried interest loophole and, and capital gains loophole. They exempt that. Now, there's not enough. The reason why the AEI study, the American Enterprise Institute study, the Tax Policy Center study, the reason they all say it's going to, taxes are going to go up in the middle class, the only way you can find $5 trillion in loopholes is cut the mortgage deduction for middle class people, cut the health care deduction for middle class people, take away their ability to get a tax break to send their kids to college. That's why they is arrive. Is he wrong about that? He is wrong about that. There, you, can, that? you can cut tax rates by 20%. And still preserve these important preferences for middle class taxpayers. Not mathematically it, possible. It, it is mathematically possible. It's been done before. It's precisely <laughs> what we're proposing. It has never been done before. It's been done a couple of times. Actually. It has never. Been Jack done Kennedy before. lowered tax rates, increased growth. Ronald oh, Reagan. Oh, now you're Jack Kennedy. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Republicans and Democrats. Republicans and Democrats have worked together on this. You'll That's I understand right. you guys aren't used but to doing bipartisan deals. But we told each other deals. what we're going to do. When we did it with Republicans Reagan, Democrats, he said, here, here are the things said, we're going to cut. Framework. Let's work together said. to fill in the details. That's exactly the details. That's how you get things done. You work with There's, Congress. Look, let me say it this way. Mitt That's Romney coming was from governor. the Republican Congress working Mitt, bipartisanly. Mitt Romney. 7% rating. Mitt Romney. Uh, not giving ExxonMobil another $4 billion tax cut this year, as John calls for, and giving it to middle class people to be able to pay to get their kids to college. We don't call that redistribution. We call that fairness, number one. Number two, factually, 95% of the small businesses in America, their owners make less than $250,000 a year. They would not get one single solitary penny increase in taxes, those small businesses. Now, with regard to the, to the health care plan, 
You know, it's with one hand you give it, the other you take it. You know how Barack Obama, excuse me, you know how John McCain pays for his $5,000 tax credit you're going to get, a family will get? He taxes as income every one of you out there, every one of you listening who has a health care plan through your employer. That's how he raises $3.6 trillion on your taxing your health care benefit to give you a $5,000 plan which his website points out, will go straight to the insurance company. And then you're going to have to replace a 12000 that's the average cost of the plan you get through your employer, it costs $12,000. You're going to have to pay, replace a $12,000 plan because $20 million of you are going to be dropped. $20 million of you will be dropped. So you're going to have to place, replace a $12,000 plan with a $5,000 check you've just given to the insurance company. I call that the ultimate bridge to nowhere. Thank you, Senator. Now, most people in America today, that famous question that Ronald Reagan asked, are you better off today than you were eight years ago? Most people would say yes. And I'm pleased to say, see Dick from the newspapers, that you're better off than you were eight years ago, too. And most of it... Uh... <laughs> And I, I can tell you, Joe, that the government had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> Let me help you with the difference, Ms. Ferraro, between Iran and the embassy in Lebanon. Iran, we were held by a foreign government. In, e in, e in Lebanon, you had a wanton terrorist action where the government opposed it. Congresswoman Farrell. Let me just say, first of all, that I almost resent Vice President Bush, your patronizing attitude that you have to teach me about foreign policy. The comment that the President made that Eastern Europe was independent and aut autonomous from Soviet control is probably one of the most outrageous statements made by a President in recent political history. It's caused great confusion in Europe. Communist newspapers in Poland are praising the president because the statement helped give credibility to Soviet control. I'm glad the president finally apologized for that remark, but it's surprising that it took six days and several attempts before we finally received that apology. I know it strikes a responsive chord for some to kick Richard Nixon around. I don't know how long you can keep that up. How much mileage is there in someone who's been kicked, whose wife suffered a serious stroke, who's been disgraced in office and stepped down from that office? And I think after two years and some months that it's probably a dead issue. Well, let them play that game. That's the only game they know. So that was a compilation of just some of the more notable moments in vice presidential debate history here in the United States. And they were not exactly in sequence, but I will give them to you. There were the debates in 1976, the vice presidential debate between... No, I'm forgetting. <laughs> I can't believe I'm forgetting who these folks are. Uh, between... Um... <laughs> Oh, dearie me, between Walter Mondale and Bob Dole, would you believe? In 1976, Bob Dole, and, you know, Bob Dole is still with us. Um, of course, he was also a presidential candidate in 1996. I think he also ran in another year as well. I some, Somehow, I think he ran in maybe 92 or in 88 or something. I'm sure he did. Um, I'm pretty darn sure of that. But he ran in 96 and was pretty much landslided by Bill Clinton in that presidential election uh, in 1996. And I think you're going to see a landslide for Joe Biden coming up in just under four weeks from now. But look, that is for another day to talk about today. Uh, people have to get out there and vote and vote early. So I will say that vote early, please, everybody. Make sure you're registered and tell people to vote early. Very important. There is early voting going on in at least 33 or 34 states. Um, so remember to please get out there and vote early if you haven't already voted. But today is the day for the vice presidential candidates. And there's other clips that you heard over those last seven and a half minutes. Um, some great clips there, by the way, the Admiral Stockdale clip. Remember in 1992 when there were three vice presidential candidates, of course, you had the independent Ross Perot's 
candidate, running mate, uh, Admiral James Stockdale there. Who am I? <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> One of the, another of the more iconic lines in a vice presidential debate. And of course, that year you also had um, Al Gore, um, the Democratic vice presidential candidate at that point, and of course, the Republican vice presidential candidate at, at that point as well, um, who at the time was still vice president. That's Dan Quayle. Uh, and of course, um, we know what happened to the Republicans that year uh, when it came to 1992 in the November election. Um, in another clip, you heard Geraldine Ferraro and George H.W. Bush. That was back in 1984. A very condescending George H.W. Bush and quite frankly, chauvinistic and sexist George W. George H.W. Bush trying to school and shoot a Geraldine Ferraro as if Geraldine Ferraro was not aware of foreign policy. It was very condescending and very rude. One of the more rude moments that I can think of in a vice presidential debate in recent memory. Very rude from and very sexist. Um, I, I can't imagine that George H.W. Bush would have ever done that to a male VP candidate standing across from him. I, I, I'm pretty, you know, I'll never know for sure now because both of them are no longer here. But I, I can, I, I will bet you 99.999% he would never do that. He would never have done that had the person standing across from him been a male. It just wouldn't have happened. The other clips you heard, two from Joe Biden, one in, nine, one in the year 2008, when he debated Sarah Palin. What a disaster Sarah Palin was in that debate. Oh, geez. And now that debate is remembered more for Tina Fey's impressions of Sarah Palin than it is for Sarah Palin herself. What a disastrous vice presidential candidate she was. Oh, God. Even members of the Republican Party, even now, have, uh, talk about her being a complete disaster. Dick Cheney, said that it was a big mistake having her a mistake having her as a VP candidate on the Republican ticket with John McCain and that and that choice was not John McCain's as far as I know it was Nicole Wallace's among others Nicole Wallace who's now on TV on MSNBC I'm not going to rip Nicole Wallace I actually think Nicole Wallace is doing a, a pretty darn decent job on MSNBC but you know look we all make mistakes right we all make mistakes you know the candidate who didn't didn't know you know didn't know what newspaper she read. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry because now it's going to turn into me, you know, castigating a female vice presidential candidate moments after I was talking about George H. W. Bush doing it. So yeah, you know, maybe I should just step back and step off. Um, it is fair criticism, however. I'm not attacking or condescending Sarah Palin. I am pointing out facts on the record. I mean, that debate was horrible that she had with Joe Biden. Joe Biden's been involved in a lot of these debates that are just nightmarish and not because of him. <laughs> you know, the, the, some of the people he's had to debate, the guy in the White House now, you know, who was sick, I'm sure pretty much was sick with coronavirus at the time. He debated him last week, you know, you know, Sarah Palin in 2008, you know, and, and Paul Ryan in 2012. You heard that clip as well. Um, great line from Joe Biden. Oh, so now you're Jack Kennedy. <laughs> oh, dear. Joe, Joe Biden has, you know, people knock Joe Biden about his debating, but he's actually, you know, he was not any great shakes in the Democratic primary. Don't get me wrong. He's probably his best debate, by the way was the debate against Bernie Sanders, ironically. And it was a, a debate that I think Bernie won head and shoulders. Um, although the first 20 minutes or so of that debate, Joe Biden was as good as he's ever been on a debate stage. And that was the one time he was any good in the Democratic primary debates. Um, and he was good last week, despite everything that was thrown at him and what he had to do. I think he did a very good job. Um, so Joe Biden, this idea that he's not this good debater is is wrong. You heard, I mean, granted this, just two clips I played, um, but those clips where he's up against Paul Ryan in 2012, 
against uh, Sarah Palin in 2008. I mean, hey, those are pretty good pieces of evidence that he is pretty darn sharp still. Um, and then you heard the debate, uh, if I can remember it correctly, um, between Lloyd Benson and Dan Quayle, <laughs> the infamous one. And I played you the extra part after that, right? The part where they are talking about, you know, after the no, your no Jack Kennedy line, which is the greatest line in the history of vice presidential debates, if not in any debate, um, Dan Quayle saying, well, I resent that senator or whatever he said. And the explanation afterwards by Benson was just priceless as well. And that part never gets played. The response never gets played by, you know, the response. And I remember watching that live at the time. It was incredible. And the look of indignation on the face of Dan Quayle. Now, here's the guy that couldn't even spell potato correctly. He had, I told you the story before, if you listen to this podcast, he had, he had a, I forget, fifth grader, eighth grader, I don't remember, right on the board, the word potato. And the fifth grader, whomever that student was, he spelled it correctly. He spelled the word correctly. <laughs> Dan Quayle. <laughs> Dan Quayle. And I forget whether he was the VP at the time or whether he was the candidate at the time. I think he was VP. And he was ta- and he told he told the young kid, the young boy, <laughs> no, that's wrong. And and the boy had written on the board, blackboard, P-O-T-A-T-O, which spells potato correctly. <laughs> and then Dan Quayle. Dan Quayle says to the young boy, no, that's incorrect. (laughs) Put an E on the end. (laughs) You forgot to get... You forgot to add an E. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. <laughs> the young boy, God bless him. <laughs> he put an E on the <laughs> He put an E on the end of it. <laughs> because you're not going to show up the vice president of the United States, are you? <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh dear. I I I I I have to say that is just well. <laughs> it's just Oh, dearie me. I I I have to tell you. Oh dear. So yeah, that happened. And I think that's all the clips that you heard. Maybe there was one or two others that I didn't um reference, but that was seven and a half minutes of vice presidential debating gold that I hope that you Um, absorbed. Uh, I know it's a lot of audio all at once, but I wanted to do it that way. Um, Just to highlight just some of the moments. And this is really all TV driven. And I think it plays very differently when you listen to it versus when you watch it. I think it can become a dizzying barrage when you watch those seven and a half minutes that you just heard versus when you hear it. Yes, it's a lot to process and sit with, but it's vivid, right? You can throw your imagination at those words, even though the words are what they are. By the way, I did forget one debate, and it was Dick Cheney up against Joe Lieberman. That was in the year 2000. Of course, um, some great lines there by both of them. Um, That was quite a crackerjack debate, that one. There was a load of one-liners in there that... And and I remember watching that one clearly 20 years ago when, when uh, there was another quip about the private sector. And you know, I thought it was interesting. Dick Cheney said, well, you know, I made all this money, but it was n- not by, with the help of the government. You know, you know the, the Republican mantra of government, we don't need no stinking government. You know, we can get rid of them. Yeah, well, I mean, this administration is living up to that billing as they desecrate the administrative state. Um, but I haven't even got to what the subject was, which is tonight's debate. Tonight, tonight, tonight. 
not to sound like Phil Collins or Genesis, but, you know, tonight. Um, tonight, <laughs> Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris will be on the stage in Salt Lake City, Utah, for the only vice presidential debate of this campaign. And I have to tell you, I've been laughing a lot, but this, what I'm about to say, is not funny. This debate should not be going forward. I'll repeat that for those of you perhaps in the back. This debate should not be going forward. Senator Kamala Harris, it was announced today, tested negative for coronavirus. Thank God. Vice President Mike Pence, and he's not going to be vice president for that much longer, God willing, has not been quarantining. There are close to 20 staff members or cabinet members or people in Trump's inner circle who all have coronavirus. At least seven of those people were infected, surely infected at that whole Rose Garden debacle which is going to go down in in political history as one of the most virus-laden political events in, in modern history. I mean, seriously. You're in a room with 200 people crammed in or you're in an outdoor area crammed in. Nobody, you know, maybe 10 people, 12 people wearing masks out of the 200, if you're lucky. And Mike Pence was sitting not far away from Tom Tillis, not far away from Kellyanne Conway, not far away from all of these people, Mike Lee, the Senator Lee, who were infected. And we've not heard a single word about, at least as of the time I'm recording this, a single word has not been heard or stuttered, uttered or muttered. As to the status, coronavirusly speaking, of Mike Pence, there has not been a single solitary word of whether Mike Pence has tested positive for coronavirus or whether Mike Pence has tested negative for coronavirus. Now, that's as of the time I'm recording this. So if there has been any new developments, I am not yet aware of them since, of course, this recording. But I want to know what the devil are the results of Mike Pence's test, assuming that he had one even. Now, the New York Times last night came out and said... um, I had a story that said uh, that Trump had not been tested regularly. Why are we not surprised by that? So if Donald Trump was not tested regularly, what what does that say about Mike Pence? Was he tested regularly? Has he been tested regularly? And what does regularly mean? Every day, every hour, twice a day? I just don't understand why, quite frankly, Senator Kamala Harris would even think about being in the same room as Mike Pence, who hasn't quarantined, who hasn't released any test that he may have taken or may not have taken. I don't know why Senator Harris would do something like this, and I'm not trying to blame her here. I just question her judgment and she's someone whose judgment for the most part has been excellent, you know, and I'm talking as a senator, her judgment. 
you know, I, I just do not understand why. Because Mike Pence, I think, is one of the extreme conservative Christians who wants to rapture, like the rest of these folks. I think they're waiting for the rapture to take them up and rapture them away. Why else would there be this death cult? They're ready for the heavens. They're ri- or wherever they're going to go. Jeez. Why on earth would you want to debate Typhoid Mike? I mean, that's potentially what you could have here. Why is Mike Pence not quarantining? Bill Barr is, for God's sake. Ivanka Trump is, for God's sakes. And others. Stephen Miller tested positive for coronavirus. Isn't that interesting? I think there's, um, if people don't believe in a higher power. (sighs) Dear, oh dear, oh dear. You know, Stephen Miller is someone who is chiefly responsible. He's the architect of throwing brown people and throwing brown kids into concentration camps and separating them from their families, thousands upon thousands of them. And then on top of that, these young kids being abused in all manner of ways and killed in some instances. That's another topic that I could divert on and talk about for an hour. But time is precious. I really am flabbergasted that Senator Kamala Harris, who is far smarter than any cretin like a Mike Pence ever could wish to be, let alone hope to be, is going to still go ahead with this debate tonight. I am shocked. Unless... There is something, as I record this, that has broken news-wise that says the debate is off or that says that, you know, Pence has tested positive. There is no way this debate should be happening. And if it happens at all, plexiglass is not going to save you. I'm sorry. They're 12 feet apart or 10 and a half, and it looks like it might be more than that. But I'm sorry, even with the plexiglass... This is an airborne virus. CDC once again, yesterday or the day before. I mean, these days all bleed into one. The CDC again reiterated, because it's flip-flopping now, you know, the deconstruction of the administrative state. Trump is controlling the doctors. He's controlling the blooming White House physician. He's, you know, it's an audience of one. The physician's got no blooming credibility. And the CDC has been told to change things. Well, I'll tell you what, the CDC actually did its job yesterday and said what we all know, what we've known, what Fauci has told us forever. This virus is airborne. Do you think a little piece of blooming plexiglass is going to save your ass? I don't think so. And that's why I'm worried about Senator Harris tonight. I'm not worried about the, sh- the job that she's going to do on the debate stage. I think she will handle Mike Pence. Thank you very much. But what I am worried about is, is she going to come down with this virus? Because of a grossly disgusting, psychopathic Mike Pence, who potentially could have this virus. I mean, he's been around all these people. He spent time outdoors and indoors with these people who got infected. You've got Hope Hicks. You've got Kellyanne Conway. You've got Stephen Miller, Tom Tillis, Mike Lee, the reverend from the the, the head of the, the Notre Dame University. I've not got to everybody. All the, the you know, you've got a hundred and twenty three. People who are staffers at the White House or Capitol Hill who have been infected, apparently, according to a GOP spokesperson. GOP spokesperson's telling you that. This is a major, major freaking disaster. And gosh, did I mention that there are over 212,000 people across this country who have died? Oh, no, no, let me rephrase that. Donald Trump has murdered 
212,000 people in this country. Uh, oh, oh, and that's not enough for you? The guy has the virus. And he's strutting around the White House, spreading this blooming thing like Typhoid Mary, Typhoid Dawn. This debate, the only way that this vice presidential debate happens tonight, in my view, should be if these two people are in separate rooms. There is no doubt in my mind that you'll have a safer, better, cleaner vice presidential debate. I mean, this is really madness. This is madness. And quite frankly, I would have them have masks on at this debate. I honestly would. I honestly would. I know it's difficult to talk for a sustained period of time with a mask on. So I know that's going to cramp their style. But if you, gosh, if you're going to even, and I have strenuously object to them in the same room. And this plexiglass stuff, I'm sorry, that is not going to cut it. Again, this virus is extremely contagious. Extremely contagious. Mike Pence is what, 60? Or close to 60? Kamala Harris, I think, is about 55 or so. Oh, God, do I mention her? You know, I I won't get her age wrong. I shouldn't be mentioning her age. Um, but she's in her mid fifties. She's in her fifties. I I think I can be polite and respectful. You know, um, the done thing is not to talk about a woman's age. Um, some women don't mind talking about it, but I'm someone who, um, until they mention, until a woman mentions her age to you, don't bring it up. Not smart. It's just not a good thing, and j- it's just not a decent thing. Uh, that's what I mean. I don't mean to sound. I, you know, it's just not decent to do that. It's not, it's not good manners in my view. But the point I'm making is that both of them are still relatively, they're young. I mean, Kamala Harris is young. Pence is young as well. Uh, but I just think this is a huge mistake. Uh, uh, a huge, you know, it's a huge mistake. They both should be in separate rooms, one in one room, run it, one in another. And do it like that. There have been debates in the past. You know. There was a debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. That was not both of them in the same room. They were in remote locations. A lot of people don't know that. But that's the truth. There was actually a debate that they did. At least one debate that they did. Where they were in two different locations. And that seemed to go quite swimmingly. So why doesn't the Commission on Presidential Debates actually go forward by going backward and revisiting that debate in 1960 where Nixon and Kennedy were in two separate locations? Didn't cramp anyone's style. If anything, it probably helped Nixon since he came off so poorly to many millions of people in that first debate, at least if you watched it on television. So, you know, again, uh, look, tonight, I think that Senator Harris is going to do very well. This debate is not going to be the really disgusting display by Donald Trump. And I think Mike Pence will acquit himself a whole lot better, demeanor-wise, decorum-wise, obviously, than his boss, That goes about saying, I think any five-year-old would acquit themselves better than Donald Trump did last week in his debate against Joe Biden, where, by the way, Donald Trump was sick. I'm sorry that there's no question about it. There's no way around it. Donald Trump was sick during that debate, and I think he had the virus then. The White House isn't saying anything, at least at last count. They're only you see this is coming out in dribs and drabs now. They're only saying that he he doesn't get he didn't get tested every day. He doesn't. So I'm telling you, this guy has this virus. We know he has it, but I think he had it on Tuesday of last week. That's five days or so after that event. Almost five days, about five days, right after the Rose Garden event. Oh my God. 
that event, I'm telling you, the wrath of all BG, you know, and I'm going to curse here. You know, I told you motherfuckers to obey my dying wish and now you will pay. I mean, (laughs) can't you just picture RBG (laughs) saying that right now? I mean, honestly. And they're paying. They are paying. You want to rush Amy Coney Barrett? The judge, you want to rush her onto the Supreme Court? Uh-uh. You ma, you ma, you guys, you're going to pay now. And, and I'm telling you, that's the wrath of RBG. And she's a very, and she, look, RBG was a very humble, decent person. Spoke with, in very few words, long pauses and silences, which is refreshing because you know, we we here in the United States do not like long silences. Some of us or many of us tend to be uncomfortable with that. But I think long silences are actually really good. They are effective. Right? Long silences. They work. I think they do. Maybe not necessarily on live television. Maybe not necessarily uh, on live radio. But they do work. And RBG, who we lost last month, is looking down at all of this. And I'm not saying that she's smiling And I'm not saying that she's even winking. But what I am saying is she is probably thinking and just observing, just observing. And so are voters. Welcome back. Expect there to be few fireworks. There will be some lines and some jabs. And I hate to talk in these boxing and sports terms, but there will be some moments, I'm sure, that will be highlight moments, I hope. Um, You're going to see grown-ups in the room tonight. Um, You saw a grown-up last week. His name was Joe Biden. He was the only grown up last week in the debate that was had there in Cleveland, Ohio. But you will actually see two grown ups tonight on the stage. Two Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Mike Pence. And I think there's so much fodder, there's so much that Kamala Harris, the senator, can use. I mean, my goodness, this guy. Mike Pence is the head of the White House task force on coronavirus. And the blimmin' guy has not released his test results. He's not quarantined with all these people in the White House being stricken with coronavirus. He's not quarantined. He mocked the plexiglass. And while that's something that Kamala Harris can talk about with the plexiglass, I would stay away from that because that's probably what Pence wants Senator Harris to talk about. She might refer to it, but I think what she's going to do is talk about his failed policy. He is someone who has overseen this task force and it has been a disaster. It has been one in disarray. There's no direction to it. The American public still isn't clearer or safer under Pence's uh, stewardship of that task force. Expect to hear things like that from Kamala Harris tonight, the senator. Expect to hear that tonight. Also expect to hear her talking about the lack of testing, the lack of tracing, no clear policy on any of that, the contradictions with the CDC, the efforts with the states that have gone awry, the PPE that still has not been uh, delivered. Now, there's still millions, there's, you know, people forgotten this because the media no longer reports on it for the most part. The corporate news media has said, oh, we know, you know, we're going to just talk about Mussolini on the balcony all day. But what people are forgetting, at least some people, 
is that still there are many hundreds of thousands of nurses and doctors, especially nurses, without protective equipment, without PPE, personal protective equipment. And that's because of Mike Pence's failed, failed task force, which is, I think, a homicidal task force. I mean, it is. I've told you many times on Twitter, certainly at the Popcorn R-E-E-L, that these folks are murderers. Donald Trump is a murderer. There's no other way around that. It's the truth. This guy has murdered over 212,000 people. And I know there are people who don't like to hear that. Oh, you call, you're call calling him. Oh, and you laugh and you ridicule it. Oh, he, no, he's not. Oh, come on. Oh, your conspiracy theory. Oh, no, no, no. He has, you know why? He knew how deadly this was. And then he lied to all of us. That is someone who is deliberately doing something. If someone had HIV, and I'm saying this with the, in context, and you knew someone who had, you knew someone who is your spouse or rather is a, a, your girlfriend or boyfriend or partner and they had contracted HIV and you have sex with them and you become infected. But you didn't know that they had HIV, but they did. Do you know that in many states in this country, that is a life sentence in prison in some cases. And that would be charged as a homicide. Not negligent. It will be charged. In some states, that's charged as first or second degree murder. To the best of my knowledge. Why wouldn't what Donald Trump has done be charged as first or second degree murder? Say why. Why wouldn't that be charged? Why wouldn't he? And don't say, well, you know, the Office of Legal Counsel says that a sitting president cannot be indicted. Well, he damn well can be indicted. That's not even law. That's some rule. That's practice. Yeah, it's practice uh, and still practice to lynch and murder black people in this country. Give me a break about, oh, that's the rule. and We're not going to change uh, the Office of Legal Counsel. Oh, dear. You know, this is this is just. I, I have to tell you, everybody, this is really a mess. It's not a revelation. That's something that we all know. And the bottom line is, no matter what happens tonight, and Mike Pence is probably going to refer to Kamala Harris's record, um, not as a senator, but as an attorney general of California and as a San Francisco district attorney. That's what you're going to hear from him tonight. I think he'll come back with, well, you know, her record, look at her record. Can we have her as vice president? Look at what she did in San Francisco. She was lenient. She was this, she was that. That's where she's, that's where he's going to go. He's going to refer to her record um, as attorney general or as, as as San Francisco's district attorney. That's what he's going to do. You're going to hear a lot of that tonight. He may start to say, well, yeah, she belongs to the, you know, Senator Harris belongs to the to radical left. Yeah, that's what that's what this absurd Arizona senators debate was last night with uh, Martha McSally, the senator out of Arizona against uh, the Democratic challenger, Captain Mark Kelly the husband of Gabrielle Giffords, the former congresswoman. And all she did all night was try to attach Mark Kelly, who is a blooming moderate, by the way, you know, moderate Democrat. And and she's trying to uh, attach, oh, you're with the radical left and socialist. And why were you hugging Elon Omar? Or why were you hugging Omar? And what were you doing in Minnesota hugging Omar? I mean, I'm sorry, that stuff does not work. It works with the racists. And I'm telling you, this particular year, they are still racist. They're still well and truly here. Some of them are more violent than others. 
But I'm telling you, Arizona is going to see through that farce that is Senator Martha McSally. Her time is up in the U.S. Senate, I'm telling you. What you're going to see tonight from Mike Pence is an attack on the record of Kamala Harris as a prosecutor. And I think he has studied the tapes of some of those Democratic debates when Tulsi Gabbard, who is nowhere to be found now. Well, she's doing things, but she's nowhere to be seen on the national stage. Maybe she's on Fox News somewhere. But when Tulsi Gabbard jabbed back, excuse the pun, the boxing metaphor is just ugh jabbed back at uh, Kamala Harris on that stage a few, you know, last year or earlier this year or last year, whenever it was. And then, I don't know, because these debates carried on into the into this year. They started in June of 2019 and continued on, I think, to January or February before we got down to two candidates and they debated in March. So for almost a year, these folks, nine months of debates. And in one of the debates anyway, Tulsi Gabbard had said something about the prosecutorial record, and it was a lie. Much of it was a blooming lie. In fact, all of it was of Senator Harris, and it rattled Harris, though. You could tell, at least I could tell. And I bet you Mike Pence has been studying that tape. I bet you he's also studied the video of Senator Harris coming out against VP Joe Biden, former vice president, on the debate stage about that little girl was me. You know, the, the fact that uh, Joe Biden did support measures against busing and against desegregation and busing and all of that and that in that kind of thing he he was against it you know that record does not get talked about now and i think quite frankly and sadly it's not relevant anymore i mean it's always important but it's not relevant to the fact that we've got a dictator although again um people should always be aware of people's records but this is something that is more urgent than a record to be honest This is about whether we're going to have a blooming country to even look at records in. Lest your books, all your books be burned. I mean, this guy is Mussolini on steroids. And I would say, I'm talking about Donald Trump here. Lest anyone, I don't know how anyone would be confused. But here's lesson number one. Never ever give a dictator or an authoritarian steroids. You never want to do that. It will not end well. But you know that Mike Pence will be tonight going after Senator Harris and trying to create a division between her and Joe Biden based on that debate, the first debate that happened, I think it was last June 2019, where Harris won that debate and challenged Joe Biden. It was a really good moment. And... You can bet that what Mike Pence will do is dig into that like a sore. You know, he'll like dig and squeeze and, uh, you know, until something pops. I know that's really disgusting and graphic and I'm sorry. But I think that's where he's going with all of that. We shall see what happens. The debate begins tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time here in the United States. That is 6 p.m. Pacific time. For those of you watching abroad, because it will be televised on Sky, um, Sky News, which is tele, which is a live service around the world, you can watch it on Sky Online, Sky News, and they will be televising the debate beginning at two a.m. UK time, two a.m. UK time. So you'll be able to see it worldwide on Sky. Um, For those of you in the UK, you can get up early or stay up late, whichever it might be, to watch the debate. It will be early Thursday morning for you. Um, For us here in the United States, it is tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern U.S. time and 6 p.m. Pacific U.S. And of course, around the world, it will be televised. This is going to be like last week, a debate that is going to be watched globally online and on television screens everywhere. CNN will be televising it internationally as well. So it should be a very interesting debate. And now, like I said, like I said with last week's, I do not think that this debate is going to change much at all. There are very few undecideds left here. Which, you know, again, I think that bodes well for the Democrats. But again, 
You have to get out there and vote. I urge you to ignore these polls. Please ignore the polls. You have to vote. We are seeing people around the country voting early, which I think is really good. I think people are understanding it. I think people are getting it. The people have seen what's happened in this country, what's happened with Donald Trump and what he's doing to destroy this country because he is destroying the country. He's destroying the administrative state in this country. He has killed over 212,000 people. He has destroyed the post office through Louis DeJoy and they are all seeing it and they have had enough. Now, I'm not saying that every single person in those long ass lines that you saw in Ohio yesterday or in Indiana yesterday or in Illinois last week or in Virginia last month are all voting for Joe Biden. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that there is record turnout and record voter engagement. And as I say all the time, if we vote in droves and vote early, this is going to be a landslide win for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I'm telling you now, if we vote early and vote in droves, this election is going to be a landslide for Joe Biden. I'm telling you, and Kamala Harris, and you will see history made. Senator Kamala Harris will be making history tonight, becoming the first black woman, the first woman of color to be a vice presidential candidate debating. Tonight's debate will be moderated by USA Today, Washington Bureau Chief and reporter Susan Page. And that seems to have been a change. Now, I didn't know about this. I only learned about this yesterday. Steve Scully, who is the C-SPAN person, he had been originally named as the... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting my metaphors mixed up here. Um, Scratch that. Steve Scully is going to be, or pending, is still going to be the moderator of the second presidential debate, if it happens. So my mistake. I am sorry for the confusion. Susan Page is going to be moderating tonight's debate, and I expect that she'll do well. I do not think she's going to have the kinds of challenges that Mike Wallace had last week. Um, And I think that both participants are going to be respectful of moderator Susan Page and let the debate begin tonight. I will be um, tweeting about this debate as it happens uh, on Twitter. So follow me there, please, at the popcorn, R-E-E-L. I may do a little video or two or one (laughs) afterwards when it's all over, to give my quick assessment, hopefully five minutes or less, I think I can make it in under five minutes, um, on Periscope and Twitter. So please follow me for that. Follow me on Twitter at the popcorn R-E-E-L. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. And don't forget the Politocrat Vote Early T-shirt color collection online as well at the following web address, the-politocrat.myshopify.com. Go right now to that website and you'll be able to see the color collection of Vote Early T-shirts. Look good. In fact, look great. Wearing one of these colorful T-shirts and with a timely message on it, to vote early. Now is the time to wear it. If you are in warmer climes, please, this is the time to be seen with that message because it's a very important one. And that message is to vote early. More colors are coming. Currently, there are three, as of this recording, three different color t-shirts. They come in purple. They come in men, you know, women's and unisex and Um, There's purple colors, there's red, there's black with vote early on the front and the Politocrat logo on the back. Look, this is a really nice T-shirt. I get compliments about it all the time. I really do. Uh, People have come up to me here in California, here in San Francisco and and said they they really do like the T-shirt. And by the way, don't forget, if you have voted 
Don't forget to wear your sticker, your I Voted sticker, every day. Wear your I Voted sticker. Wear it every day for these next 27 voting days so that you can remind people to vote. Jog their memories. You don't have to say a thing to them. Just wear that sticker and wear one of my shirts at the Politocrat online store, that great Vote Early t-shirt color collection. And let me tell you, you will have people noticing your message and the colors of your shirt. So please go to the online store right now and I'll put a link to it in the liner notes of this episode. But again, the website address is the-politocrat.myshopify.com. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. Please subscribe to the podcast. I'm Omar Moore. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Gonna be a bride.